While there are 16 dedicated books of prophecy in our scriptures, prophecy is evident in most of the books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Prophecy is simply everywhere. But what is the purpose of prophecy? Why is it there? The purpose of prophecy is to show that God is true, so that no man can plead ignorance in the coming day of judgment. Prophecy shows that Yahweh is God, that the scriptures are his word time and time again, beyond a doubt. This is something which Yahweh himself teaches us in Isaiah when he challenges the pagan idols to prove that they are gods by speaking about the future and the past. Let them bring them forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. In the parable of Lazarus, the rich man pleads with Abraham to let him warn his brethren. But Abraham in the parable reminds him that Moses and the prophets are there to teach men that God is true. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And there are, of course, many evidential proofs of the resurrection of Christ. And there are hundreds of prophecies in Scripture, many consisting of both a near and a far vision. The near represented a more immediate fulfillment, which in part also showed that the prophet was true and from Yahweh. And then, an ultimate transcendental fulfillment which further glorifies God. This ability for God to weave the fabric of history together, for it to rhyme and to be bookended in this way, is truly awe-inspiring. But because Judeo-Christians generally lack the scriptural and historical understanding to interpret most of prophecy, it is a common theme for them to entirely ignore it by postponing it to some ambiguous future date. Some even have the audacity to discard the explicit promises found in the prophets so that they themselves can better justify lies such as the concept of spiritual Israel. But for all of time, prophecy was known to be living and active, showing the validity of God as history actively progressed. Historicism was the only valid interpretation to early Christians. It is a fact that a majority of the prophecies of the major and minor prophets played out in real time. Concerning the Revelation, John was told that the things being spoken of were to begin to happen immediately, and they have indeed unfolded over the past period of 2,000 years, and we are now in Mystery Babylon. It wasn't until when the Catholic Church was seeking to hide itself from Christian accusations during the Reformation that the perverse deceptions of preterism and futurism were formed. In reality, these concepts are devices fabricated by the enemies of God to trivialize scripture and pacify men. Most of biblical prophecy has been fulfilled, this is a fact, and one of the most awe-inspiring prophecies of scripture is one which those same enemies of God distaste so much that they will often cover it with a black cloth. They will cover it with a black cloth because it not only proves God to be true without a doubt, but also that Christ is the Messiah and that there can be no other. The prophecy we're talking about is Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. Now Daniel was a prophet of the captivity in Babylon and he was praying regarding the 70 years that Jerusalem would lay in ruins 
as they were revealed unto Jeremiah the prophet. Jerusalem was destroyed, and the holy people were dispersed in captivity. So Daniel prays as he anticipates the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and after admitting the faults and the sins of Israel and Judah, he prays for mercy from the Almighty. Then Yahweh sends the messenger Gabriel to answer Daniel's prayer. And not only does Gabriel comfort Daniel that the city will be rebuilt, but he explains to Daniel why it's being rebuilt. It's being rebuilt in order to pave a way for the Messiah. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision of prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Firstly, it can be established that a day in prophecy often represents a year and therefore a prophetic period of 70 weeks amounts to 490 years. So Daniel was being told that the rebuilt Jerusalem and remnant nation surrounding it will allow the Messiah to make an end of sin in roughly that amount of time. The very purpose of going back to Jerusalem and rebuilding the temple is identified here as a means to finish the transgression and to anoint the Most Holy. Jerusalem needs to be rebuilt because the Messiah needs to live a perfect life, and that includes things such as him presenting himself to the temple three times a year. He needs to be slain by Edomites, who are still principally in the region of Palestine. He needs to gather apostles. This also fulfills several other prophecies such as the tents of Judah being saved first. So there's many reasons. Essentially, Israel and Judah, who have now been divorced at this time, are paving the way for their own reconciliation. This was accomplished by Christ because what he did is what is described here in the prophecy. Let's read it. To finish the transgression, well, this transgression is the state of divorce between Christ and Israel, and reconciliation was accomplished by Christ. To make an end of sins, this is a legal end of sins, not a physical end. This was done by Christ, and now if the seed is in you, your sin is not imputed to you any longer. Because we're now dead, we're therefore alive in Christ. To make reconciliation for iniquity. And Christ reconciled divorced Israel to himself. And Paul called his ministry a ministry of reconciliation. Christ came to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's their iniquity being spoken of here. And as Paul had written in Ephesians chapter 2, and that he might reconcile both unto God both the Israelites in Judea and the Israelites who were dispersed in former times, unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Or in Colossians chapter 1, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven and he can't be reconciling anything except what he promised to reconcile in the prophets. To seal up the vision. Now where we see the word seal in Greek, it often means to ensure or to make something sure. It's not covered up in this instance, as many would jump to assume in this verse. The NAB, for example, uses the word ratified. And finally, to anoint the Most Holy. There's prophecies of the anointing of the Messiah in Zechariah. And Christ, Christos, literally means anointed in Greek. Think of how profound this is. The very purpose of the Messiah 
has been described in detail. But now the timing of it adds yet another dimension. And in the following verse, we read, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. So it says here that the weeks of the prophecy would not begin until the, quote, going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, and not only the temple or the walls. This did not happen until the time of Ezra, around 458 BC. Then we read here in Daniel that from that time unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. That is 69 prophetic weeks, and therefore represents 483 literal years. So let's do the math. But first, before we do that, let's acknowledge that dates in ancient history are sometimes complicated to determine, as much of it depends on how men want to rectify the reigns of kings, whether the first year is counted inclusively or simply counted forward from the time of coronation, and the differences between these two will eventually build up and result in exponential differences between different reckonings. So while we may be off our estimate here by a small handful of years, the window of time is nevertheless clear and evident. Ezra receives his commission around 458 BC. 483 years later is roughly 25-26 AD. Luke 3.1 tells us that Christ began his ministry during the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which was 28 AD. So taking into account a small handful of years, since historical years can be hard to reckon, this is nevertheless a near exact spot on timing for the beginning of the Messiah's ministry, as we've just determined it. How could anyone but God ever give such a perfect window? Concerning the troublous times, those troubling times are seen in Nehemiah and Ezra. Cyrus died, and his successor received letters from the people in the villages around the area of Jerusalem, Canaanites, Edomites, some Samaritans, who were causing trouble for the people in Jerusalem. But regardless of their adversity, the city was eventually built. This is giving a reassurance to the people that no matter how much adversity they faced, that the city and temple will be rebuilt because it has to happen. It has to pave a way for the Messiah so that God can keep his promises to Abraham. And prophets such as Haggai and Zechariah also gave comfort to the people while they were doing this thing. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. The three score and two weeks don't indicate an immediate expiry, but that it will happen sometime after this date. A 32 AD crucifixion can be assured from Luke 3.1 and the Passovers as they are counted in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, there are three Passovers mentioned, and of course, other feasts. And during the third, Christ is crucified. If it was three and a half years, we know this because Christ began his ministry in around autumn of 28 AD, and his crucifixion was therefore around spring of 32 AD. Cut off but not for himself. He died for the sake of the people. He is the man of sorrows, the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 who was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He didn't die to redeem himself for anything he did, but for what us, Israel, the woman did, and so that we could have reconciliation. Here the people of the prince are mentioned. These people of the prince are the people of the same prince who has been indicated to us this entire prophecy, Messiah the Prince. And it is told that they will destroy the city of Jerusalem after the Messiah dies. That is what's being told here. In 70 AD, the Romans did just that. Therefore here the Romans are being identified as the people of the Prince, which is fitting and which is true, because they are also heirs of the covenant. The Romans were Trojan Judahites from the Zerah branch of Judah. Paul recognized and understood Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, and since the Messiah had already been cut off in his time, he knew that the destruction of Jerusalem was therefore imminent. He was keeping his eyes open. Paul identified the Romans as the principal people of the prince capable of carrying out this task. And this is why Paul said that they will bruise Satan, which is a collective, under their feet shortly in his epistle to them. And he was ultimately correct in his estimation. Perhaps it was even shown to him by Christ, but that is, of course, conjecture. Paul elsewhere identified the Jews in Jerusalem as Satan, in places such as 2 Thessalonians. Josephus notes that all the noble peoples left Jerusalem in between the two sieges, likely because they had the warnings of Christ and they believed him. Now Josephus describes the vile character and the disgusting things done by those who remained. Josephus elsewhere also talked about the Essenes being Judahites by birth, and then the Idumean heritage of the Herods. Many of the Pharisees, but not all, were also Edomites, and this is why, being not the sheep of Christ, they did not believe his warnings. They stayed in Jerusalem, and they suffered, and they were dispersed, and that was the dispersion of the bad figs of Jeremiah. Jewish-centric commentators are simply unable to connect the Trojan Romans with Christ because they love him more than they love Jesus. But the context here is not changed. The prince here is still Christ, and the people of the prince are, in effect, his kinsmen avengers. His kinsmen avengers. Desolations. Christ told his opponents that he was to leave their house to them desolate, and so it was. Jeremiah was told that Jerusalem was a broken bottle nation, never to be restored. And the purpose of the 70 weeks nation seen here is to build the temple and pave a way for the Messiah so he can be ushered in and so he can make a remission for errors. But this was never a permanent restoration. Once Christ accomplished his mission, there is no longer any reason for Jerusalem to stick around any longer. In Malachi, we see that in the future, the Edomites would return to Palestine to rebuild the desolate places. So anyone there today cannot be Israel. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Here it says in the midst of the week. So the ministry of Christ here can be dated to three and a half years, which is half of one week. So in the middle of that week, he will die. And when he dies, it will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, because he is the final legitimate sacrifice. 
sacrifice and oblation to cease, there's no more reason for a Levitical priesthood, as we now have the Melchizedek priesthood, which is older than the Levitical priesthood, and thus transcends it. Christ only needed to make the sacrifice once, as Paul explains in Hebrews, because his sacrifice released the woman from the penalty of the law. When the city is destroyed, the sacrifices cease, and they have not resumed since, except for a very short period during the later Jewish revolt. Simply, there has been no sacrifices for roughly 2,000 years now, since the Romans destroyed the temple. Overspreading of abominations, the abomination of desolation comes after the desolation, and we see it in the genitive case in the Gospels. This abomination is nothing other than the Muslims who came later and their so-called Dome of the Rock. Even until the consummation, Jerusalem was in fact desolate as soon as Christ died, and the consummation here is the destruction of Jerusalem. Now one may also observe a more transcendental fulfillment here regarding the most ultimate consummation, and that Jerusalem will remain desolate, therefore, until the second advent. I believe that is also a valid interpretation. The Jews there today are frauds. They are the Edomites of Malachi, who return to build the desolate places. Jerusalem is still desolate, and it will remain desolate until the second advent of the Christ. That determined shall be poured upon the desolate. This is the cup of Yahweh's wrath, the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans then, and the lake of fire tomorrow. Now, certain fools have claimed these final segments of Daniel to be speaking of a supposed singular Antichrist, despite the scriptures plainly identifying Antichrists to be a collective entity, much like the woman is the Bride of Christ. There is no singular Antichrist here. It was Christ, and no other, who confirmed the covenant with many for one week. The Antichrist didn't do that. Christ caused the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The Antichrist didn't do that. To say that Antichrist confirms a covenant is ridiculous. The entire theology of gap theory is a cover for their crimes, a cover for the Edomites who slew Christ. There is no doubt that their descendants today love and nurture this perverse theory. And this theory denies Christ and it denies his sacrifice. So what have we learned? We have learned prophecy in scripture is to show that God is true more than for us to know the future. As we look in hindsight, we see the efficacy of God being displayed throughout history. The purpose of the 70 weeks kingdom was to pave a way for the Messiah, and the second temple was built so that the Messiah could fulfill the law. Once the Messiah reconciled Israel to himself, the 70 weeks nation no longer had any purpose and was therefore destroyed by the Romans. The Messiah of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy has to be Yahshua Christ, who was born at the appointed time and who fulfilled these appointed things. He made an end of sin, and it is him who is the prince throughout this whole prophecy. Those who say otherwise make excuses for the enemies of God. This prophecy is incredible, because think about it. This is essentially what the angel told Daniel that in 483 years, which is a very specific date, a very specific window of time, in 483 years, the Messiah is going to be born. And the Messiah is the very purpose of why you are going back to rebuild the city. The Messiah will make an end of sins and make reconciliation with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
he will be anointed, and you will call him Christ. The city will be built to accomplish this, and it will remain long enough, even in hard times. When the Messiah comes, he will have a ministry for three and a half years, and then after those three and a half years, he will die, but not for himself. Once he dies, he will be the final sacrifice, and there will be no need for sacrifices ever again. After his death, Israelites will come, and they will destroy Jerusalem, and the city will remain desolate after that time. When we look at it this way, we see just how incredible this prophecy is. And when put together with other awe-inspiring prophecies in other prophets, such as how Zechariah told us that the Messiah's name would be Yahshua, and that he would be called the Branch, or the Psalms, telling us in detail that he would be crucified, and by whom. There is no doubt at all that Yahweh is God, that Yahshua was the Messiah. And because all of this has been accomplished, anyone who denies Christ as the Messiah is a fool, and they are Antichrist. Thank you for watching, and praise Yahweh, the God of Israel. Thank you for watching this video. If you are interested in learning more about this topic, an unabridged written version of the presentation is available on truthbids.net. Thank you for watching, and praise Yahweh, the God of Israel.